Awaited Saviour, Imam Zamana, my respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Zainab al sughra translated as Zainab the Younger, is better known as Lady Umm Kurthum, who is the second daughter of Lady Fatima al Zahra and the commander of the faithful Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'een. Historians believe that she was born anywhere between the 6th to the 9th year after Hijra, and that she passed away from this world 40 days after the companions, family members, returned back from the captivity period from Kufa and Damascus back into the city of Medina. And therefore, straight away, we can observe from the timeline in which she was involved in, being born in either the 6th or up to the 9th year of Hijra, all the way to the time after the Ahl al-Bayt returned back into, from, from captivity, we can see that she is not only in real proximity to the greatest personalities of the Ahl al-Bayt, but also she was a first-hand witness and participant in regards to some of the most famous and important events in Islamic history. We see straight away that she spent time with her grandfather, the Holy Prophet of Islam, Hazrat Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which means she also witnessed his demise. And therefore she was also present in the house when the house was attacked by the enemies of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. It also means she was present and witnessed to when the enemies of Ahl al-Bayt took her father out of the house and demanded the allegiance be paid to those particular people. We find as time moves on, she also would have moved with her father towards the city of Kufa, where she too would have been a princess, just like her elder sister. And we also find that she would have witnessed the demise of her second brother and her first brother, Imam al-Hassan and Imam al-Hussein. And we find that she was in captivity and when brought all the way back. The fact that she is participating in such important elements of our history the history that we hold so close and dear to ourselves, and in fact know so well, despite this level of contribution and participation, it is surprising that we as a community generally do not know as much about this younger sister, Zainab al-Sughra, as what we do compared to her elder sister, Zainab al-Kubra. And straight away, when we look at it from this angle, we feel aggrieved, because we can see the contributions of the other siblings within the family, one knows what the trials and tribulations, the contributions of our second imam were. One knows the lessons and the sacrifice of the master of the martyrs. And one knows what Zainab al-Kubra, peace be upon her, has left for us, not only in her sermons, but also in the way that she stood tall against the enemies and looked after the family members. We know tafsir from her blessed tongue. But the question we pose here at this point Comparatively, what do we know about the personality of Zainab al-Sughra, sallallahu alayha? Do we know of her sermons? Do we know of her poetry? Do we know of her tafsir? Do we know where tafsir and mufassirin have mentioned as to where she has been subscribed to in the Holy Qur'an? And therefore, straight away, we may observe that there has been an imbalance. The question we can pose now is, why have we inherited this situation? Generally, as a community, if we know so much about the elder sister, Zainab al-Kubra, peace be upon her, what are the reasons that we can assess as to why we know so little comparatively about the younger sister? Generally, we find there are three. The first reason is because in regards to the way history has been written and the biographies that have come down to us, very rarely do we see the name of Lady Umm Kurthum alayha, mentioned. We find often that she is mentioned as someone who is the daughter of her two great parents, or maybe the sister of these two great imams. But as for her own dedicated work, as for a biography or analysis of her own contributions, we find this has been lacking up until now in history. And you can imagine over 1400 years what the consequence of that lack of material would have done generation after generation how the youths and the scholars would have interpreted the absence of contribution and understanding. The second reason as to why there is an absence in regards to what we know of this great lady 
is because there is a difference of opinion in the Shia school of thought as to whether she existed at all or not. Now that may come as a surprise to many of us because we know in history there are many debates. What took place in such and such an incident? Who was present? What took place at this time? But for us to debate the existence of a personality from amongst the Ahlul Bayt, especially as someone so close in proximity to the great personalities of Rasulullah, the Lady of Light and the Commander of the Faithful may be strange. But yet we find there are some Shia historians that say she did not exist at all. There is no such person as Zainab al-Sughra. There is no person as Lady Umm Kurthum, the second daughter. What they believe is there is only one daughter. There is Imam al-Hassan, peace be upon him, Imam al-Hussein, peace be upon him, and one sister by the name of Zainab only, no younger. And therefore, because many scholars have presented their opinion that she did not exist, as a consequence, again, subsequently, we can imagine that many people have stopped writing and pondering and researching further upon this individual. The third reason as to why there is little in history known about her is because within, again, the Shia school of thought, there are some scholars who believe that Lady Umm Kurthum alayha, married the second caliph, Umar Khattab. Now again, that will come as a very strange idea to many people. And I can already see some of the eyebrows being raised at this. There are some Shia scholars, grand, very famous Shia scholars that are household names that will believe that she married Umar al-Khattab. Straight away one will question, how is it possible that our school of thought believes that Umar participated, nay, led the assassination of the Lady of Light, but her second daughter can be married to this man? The reason being is because amongst the crimes committed by Umar Khattab was that he forced this marriage upon the commander of the faithful to give his daughter. Now this is disputed. There are differences of opinion. But the reason as to why this is significant in regards to our understanding of her is because there are many people within our school of thought that as a means to reject the marriage ever taking place in the first place, they reject her existence in the first place. How can you say she married Umar if she doesn't exist in the first place? And therefore, you can imagine that over a period of 1400 years, what we have inherited about this wondrous lady, and ultimately we find that comparatively we know very, very little about her. We know very little about her sermons. We know very little about her poetry. And we know very little about her key contributions that leave a legacy of lessons for you and I to take. However, despite this, there are others who have written against these ideas and said, no, she definitely does exist. No, she did not marry Umar. This incident did not take place. And therefore, these incidents are stepping stones for us to understand the wider personality of this individual. We find that there have been many people who have written and provided us with a number of jewels and gems for us to take ones that we can analyze and understand into our own life. We find that we come into our own situation. We have an opportunity from tonight to change our understanding of this personality. We have a very wonderful calendar. Our calendar is very structured. We have Muharram, Safar, Rabi al-Awwal, Shah Ramadan, and so on and so forth. Within these months, of course, we celebrate and commemorate the births and the deaths of the holy personalities. But we will note that this particular holy personality, Lady Umm Kulthum alayha, is not within our calendars. We have a birth and a death date, which we come to the mosque for Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. We come for, of course, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And indeed, we come for Sayyidah Zainab sallallahu alayha. But within our own calendars, we have not dedicated one night towards the birth and the death of this great personality. That in itself may be something that from tonight onwards our communities can change. By virtue of realizing that we do have enough information, there is enough in the books of history for us to understand her and see what lessons she has left for us to delve into. As an example, we find famously on the night, on the 19th of Shah Ramadan, the commander of the faithful, is now opening this iftar 
for the time in which he is preparing himself because in the forthcoming hours his blessed head will be struck by Ibn Muljim. As we know famously, he opens this iftar with none other than this daughter of his, Lady Umm Kulthum sallallahu alayhi What a wonderful opportunity for you and I to see this personality as an individual, to see her in her own light for her own accomplishments. We find actually as we go forward in time, she is adorned with probably one of the most beautiful titles that is in existence adorned to the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them all. Her elder sister, Zainab al-Kubra, peace be upon her, is given the title Ummul Masaib. Ummul Masaib is a very deep title that is adorned to her. It means that she is the mother of all of this Masaib, all of this grief. We see that she lost her grandfather. We see how much she was in proximity to her brother. We see how she led the family and how she was so strong. And therefore, the title is deserved, Ummul Masaib. But in history, what title is given to Sayyida Zainab al Sughra? Is there a title which can be compared to this? There is. The title in history that is given to this younger daughter is Ummul Nawaha. Ummul Nawaha. Nawaha, the root word of it is Noha. We have just recited Noha. Noha is lamentation. It's for us to provide us with an elegy to recite for our grief that is within our heart. Imagine being given the title in history of Ummul Nawaha, the mother of all the recitations of lamentations. What does that say about her personality? What does that say about her as an individual? It shows us that she was one who in her own right and personality started the movement of the recitation of Noha in the first place. Imagine we come and we sit and we recite our Noha, but she is Ummul Nawaha. Therefore, every lamentation that is recited in any language around the world from 1400 years ago to 1400 years from now goes back to her own elegies and goes back to her own lamentations. She is very famous for her own lamentations. We recall on the day of Arba'im, every dhakir in the world will come and recite the famous lines of Sayyida Umm Kulthum. She approaches the city of Medina. What does she say? O city of my grandfather, do not accept us. Imagine saying those words. Imagine what she had been through in entering towards that city. Oh, city of my grandfather, where I grew up, do not accept us. We left you with our brothers and with our sons, and we come back to you with none of them with us. She is famous for these lines of poetry and for her lines of lamentation to the extent that when she returned to Medina, She was one who organized so many morning sessions, so many gatherings in her own house to remember the martyrs of Karbala that the governor of the time placed her under house arrest and stopped the people of Medina coming to sit with her. Forty days later, she passed away from this world. Straight away, when we begin to put the pieces of the jigsaw into this grand personality's life, we can see how much she has contributed towards us. And therefore tonight, I want to present to you one particular incident. And that is an incident that took place on the night of Ashura. It is a unique incident in all of history. And it is a conversation that takes place between the master of the martyrs, her brother, and this great personality, Lady Umm Kurthum, salawatullah wa salamu alayha. And insha'Allah, through this one particular incident, we may be able to observe how much of a grand personality she was and the proximity towards her brother and in the reality how close her brother was to looking at her as an individual, leaving us with the same lesson. The night of Ashura is one of huge significance. Now it's easy for us to say that We can say it very quickly. The night of Ashura is, of course, important. We hear upon this night that there was tasbih being recited. 
We know that they asked for one additional night to serve and worship their creator and sustainer. But beyond just this at a very superficial level, there is a deep significance towards the night of Ashura. The reason for this is because it predicates the day of Ashura. What we mean by this is the day of Ashura is the grandest day in history. Which movement in the history of humankind comes close to the day of Ashura? Which sacrifice can ever compare to this day? And therefore, for this day to be preluded by this night, this night itself must have huge significance as well. We think back and look at the personalities involved. Even though it may be obvious to us, we can recount it, we can become conscious of who was present. We have three infallible imams. We have grand personalities like Lady Zainab al-Kubra, Zainab al-Sughra. We have these great ladies. We have great members of Ahl al-Bayt, Abu Fadl Abbas, who was a faqih in his own right. Imagine Ali Akbar, what a human he must have been. And then we have the greatest companions known to the Ahl al-Bayt. Imagine under a tent, these personalities sitting and discussing for one final night. Imagine the gems that have been left for you and I. And therefore the night of Ashura is not an ordinary night in history. The number of lessons are phenomenal. In fact, there are entire volumes of books written specifically about the lessons from the night of Ashura. The night of Ashura, for the master of the martyrs, is broken into four stages. It's broken into four parts. He has to equally divide his time amongst four things so that he, as the imam, sets the precedent as to how someone should be within their day, (coughs) even if it's going to be on such a precarious night as the night of Ashura. He splits it into four. The first quarter is that he spends it between himself and his creator and sustainer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As an example, we know that he recites Qur'an this night. We know that he supplicates this night. We know on this night he does not forget his Salat al-Layl. This is between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the second quarter is that he has to spend time between himself and his family members. So he would sit with his daughters, he would sit with his sons and engage with them one to one. How many times on this night do we recount a tradition between him and his daughter, Bibi Sakina, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a conversation between them? And he also has to have time for his companions. His companions, by his own words, are the most noble companions that he has known. And therefore, he will spend time with them as individuals as well. One of the most famous traditions is that when he's walking the night, and one of his companions, Nafir, is walking behind him. And Nafir eventually catches up to him. And the imam says to him, Shall I show you where the martyrdoms will take place tomorrow? Here is where Akbar will fall. And here is where the arms of Abu Fadl Abbas will be severed. So he still spends time with his own companions. And the fourth quarter, the fourth part of this night, the balance of this human being on the night of Ashura, is that he spends time for himself. He spends time knowing that he needs to look within deep himself. One narration that we start this issue on. And it says that on this night of Ashura, the imam was sitting alone. Picture this in your mind, this grand personality. If this was the last night of our life, imagine how we would float and we would gravitate towards this imam as much as we could for these final minutes. The imam is sitting alone and he is cleaning his sword. He's preparing his sword tomorrow to strike the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As he's cleaning the sword, he's reciting lines of poetry to himself. O oh time, shame be upon you. Whose friend are you really? But indeed, the issue is always with him, and unto him shall we return. He would repeat these lines over and over again whilst cleaning his sword. Our fourth imam narrates, he says, I was in the tent, and I was struggling between illness and being awake. 
between this point of consciousness and going into subconsciousness. And I heard my father reciting these lines of poetry, and I realized what he meant. I realized that tomorrow was the day. And I began to choke back tears. But my auntie, Sayyida Zainab al Kubra, she was sitting beside me in the tent. She could not control herself. She bursts into tears, removes, runs out of that tent, and heads straight towards her brother Aba Abdullah. Oh, my dear brother, how can you say such things? How can I survive after you? I have only just lost my grandfather, Rasulullah. My father and mother have only just departed. I lost my brother Hassan like just yesterday. And now you are telling me that you will depart. At this point, hearing this commotion, the ladies of Ahl al-Bayt also leave their tent and they begin to cry and wail, cry and wail. One of them who comes forward is the second sister. Zainab al-Sughra, Lady Umm Kurthum, peace be upon her. She cries out her own words. The words that we recounted at the beginning of the Arabi khutbah. We said, when she calls out, وَجَعَلَتْ Sayyida Umm Kurthum tunadi." Umm Kurthum calls out, she cries out, Wa Ahmada, Wa Aliya, Wa Hasana, Wa Akha, Wa Husayna. وَذِيْعَتُنَا بَعْدَكْ يَا أَبَا عَبْدِ اللَّهِ Oh, Ahmad. Oh, Ali. Oh, Hassan. Oh, my brother. Oh, Hussein. وَذِيْعَتْ How much we are to lose after your demise. Oh, Aba Abdi Allah. Now, these words were between this wonderful brother and this wonderful sister conversing with each other in this moment of grief on the night of Ashura. Imam replies to her. He actually attends and he addresses all of them in the entire hadith. He says, O Zainab and O Kulthum and O Rubab and O Sakina. But before he addresses all of them, he directs a response back towards his dear sister Um Kulthum. He says, O my sister Um Kulthum, be consoled by the consolation of Allah. Now, this particular dialogue between these two personalities may be considered ordinary. It can be overlooked. However, there are deep oceans between these two personalities. Imagine we were sitting. Imagine you and I were sitting on that night of Ashura. And we heard Aba Abdullah al Hussein, the master of the martyrs, addressing his sister. Would we not believe there is depth within the statement? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the tongue of an infallible. وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Does this verse not become applicable to the master of the martyrs as well? When he speaks, he still does not speak of his own, not of his own whim. Even the lessons that he provides to his sister on this night, there will be deep oceans within it. And for a sister to be able to comprehend those deep oceans, she must have deep ma'rifah of her own brother and still give lessons for you and I. So they converse at this level. This conversation is a unique conversation in history. She calls out and she begins to talk to him. The first lesson that we notice is that the master of the martyrs takes her, the sister, Um Kurthum, to be an individual personality. Even though there are other ladies there, he addresses his younger sister. Now this is significant because we have been pointing out that maybe within our own communities we have not done justice by treating her as an individual to herself. Look on the night of the 19th of Shah Ramadan. The commander of the faithful treats her as such an individual that he has his final meal with her one to one. On the night of Ashura, Aba Abdullah addresses her one to one. So that all of humanity, all of history, the universe, can be inherited and given this one lesson from her. They treated Lady Umm Kurthum as an individual. They saw her as a personality. And therefore we too must also look upon her as the individual personality. Then we look at the words that were exchanged between these two people. The words start out with a cry. 
وا أحمدا وا عليا وا حسنا We see here in Arabic that there is a cry, a call. Some of them name it harf nida a cry. This cry is different to a calling of someone else. When we call someone in Arabic, when we go to Hajj, and someone wants to call you, if they don't know your name, they address you, Ya Muhammad, or Ya Hajji. And you know that they're talking to you. Everybody looks around. Everyone's Hajji on that day. Everyone turns around, me? So when they call you, they call you with Ya, Ya Muhammad. But here we see, and famously we know, when there is a cry of distress, they change the letter from a Ya to Wa. They don't say Ya Ahmad, they say Wa Ahmada. It changes to the letter Wow. In Arabic grammar, there is a reason for this, that it moves towards understanding that this is a deep call of distress. We see this cry often from the night of Ashura onwards, all the way. But in fact, it's all the personalities of Ahlul Bayt that have also used this cry. An incident takes place when the house of Ahlul Bayt was attacked by the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the door falls upon the Lady of Light, and when the commander of the faithful is dragged out of his house with a rope tied around his neck and a sword pointing towards his blessed face, Salman al Muhammadi notes a narration. He says, how could people like this do such a thing to a man like this? How could people who are so low perform an action to a man who is so grand? And then Salman narrates that Ali ibn Abi Talib also used this harf al-nida. He also exchanged the ye for the wow. He called out, wa hamza, but I do not have hamza on this day to protect me. Ya, he says, wa ja'fara, but I do not have ja'fara tayya to protect me on this day. So even the commander of the faithful used to call out like this, wa hamza and wa ja'fara. And Ibn Kulthum in her distress calls out the same. Wa ahmada, wa aliya, wa hasana, wa husayna, wa dhi'atuna ba'dak, ya aba abdillah. How can we bear after losing you, O aba abdillah? How can we bear this separation? How are we going to live after your demise, after your brutal martyrdom? The commentators, when they look at this statement, they say that this was a statement beyond just losing the person of Aba Abdullah. It was what he represented that we were going to lose. He was the last of Ahl al Kisa. He was the last to see the revelation take place. He was the last of the people of Mubahila. And when he was to be martyred, all of these things were to be taken away from us. It wasn't just the personality of Aba Abdullah, the master of the martyrs. That man who sat, and that man and that young boy who had that kisa wrapped upon him, when Jibreel Amin descended with words from Allah that I have not created anything, illa fi muhabbatiha al khamsati ladhinahum, Tahtil Kisa was for that man. How much we are to lose after your martyrdom, Abba Abdullah. And that's what she meant with that deep cry. And the master of the martyrs responded. And he says, Oh my dear sister Um Kurthum, be consoled by the consolation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you ever heard words like this? In all of the years of majalis that you have been coming to, all the books that you have read, all the sermons that you have listened to, have you heard words like this from an infallible? Be consoled by the consolation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This statement, according to commentators, appears to be unique. This cannot be found by any other infallible. No other infallible has mentioned these words to anyone else. And the words are so deep because to be consoled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different to how you and I console each other. We have to console each other. Our family members pass away. Our friends pass away. We lose the worldly blessings that we have been blessed with. And as such, we help each other. 
we have empathy and we have sympathy and we have an arm around the shoulder. We say, you can cry upon my shoulder. I'm here for you. Can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do that for us? He doesn't show us that kind of consolation. What did the master of the martyrs, whose tongue is purified, mean when he said to his pure sister, be consoled by the consolation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Commentators divide this into four possible meanings. The first one is that what he means to say is that the consolation of Allah should come in the knowledge, in the ma'rifah, that this incident was something that is designated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter what is going to happen, I am going to be martyred by these evil tyrants of a human being. We see on the night, and even on the day of Ashura, Imam sits with his young daughter Sakina, and he strokes her blessed head, and she says to him, Oh my dear father, can you not take us back to Medina? Please, take us back to Medina. This is amongst the cries, Al-Atash, Al-Atash, please take me back to a place where I feel safe. The response from the master of the martyrs to his daughter, Oh my dear daughter, know that even if the sand grouse was left in its place, they would still go after me. No matter what is to happen, they will continue to try to shed my blood. And therefore, oh my dear sister Um Kurthum, be consoled by the consolation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this event is going to take place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed that my blood save Islam and save humanity in itself. The second reason as to why he could have said these words is because he wanted her to know that with this sacrifice came the grandest, the most supreme of pleasure from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nothing compared to this sacrifice, oh my dear sister. Be consoled by the consolation of Allah that every breath that you take, every cry that you make, every time you face yourself in front of the enemy tyrants, this is the greatest sacrifice and reward known to human history. A verse of Quran speaks about this. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُورِ وَنَقْسِ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرَ صَابِرَ الْمُؤْمِنِ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَجَابُوا مُصِيبَةً قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِّن رَّبِّهِمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُهْتَدُونَ That you are going to be tested. We are going to test you in these ways. You will face this pain and this difficulty. But give glad tidings to those people who bear patiently through this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his blessings upon these people. And the third reason, oh my dear sister, take consolation from the consolation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That know that we have designated that there will come a man from amongst us who will rise and take revenge upon our behalf. On that night of Ashura, in the tent, there's an incident that takes place where the imam is sitting with all of his family and all of his companions. And he sits and he says, know that you will achieve paradise tomorrow. And know that after our demise, we, the Ahl al-Bayt, will be risen from our graves. And a man from my grandson, Muhammad al Baqir will come and take revenge for us. He is Al-Qa'im. He is the Mahdi. Can you imagine this statement being made in front of these great companions? How much they would have wanted to be part of that mission. And therefore have consolation from the consolation of Allah that he has guaranteed that this man will rise. We cry out every Friday. Where is that man who will bring about the revenge for the martyrdoms in Karbala? And the fourth reason as to why the Imam made this statement to Her Blessed Holiness, Lady Um Kurthum, is because of the end of the narration itself. He says, Oh, my dear sister, know that everything in this earth will perish. And every living creature must die. And everything in existence will eventually be destroyed. Why make these words? Because the master of the martyrs wanted to remind his dear sister that there will come a time that we all must perish and we will all be risen before Allah 
for accountability. And every one of those men who will strike the sword at me tomorrow, and every one of those men that will slap you, and every one of those men that will take your hijab, they will face an accountability like no other on the Day of Judgment. Be consoled by the consolation of Allah that He will ensure that you are given satisfaction on the Day of Judgment. What level of depth these two personalities could speak at. If you look at these words on a very superficial level, you will bypass them. But the more you delve into this great wondrous personality, the more you will see that she is an individual who stands tall as a giant of Ahlul Bayt, and in the reality is crying out for you and I to know her as an individual. There's an incident one day that took place that says, Imam al-Khomeini, may Allah's blessings be upon him forever, he one day recited the Masaib. He recited the Masaib of Lady Zainab al-Kubra, peace be upon her. And after the Masaib, he went home and he went to sleep. In his dream, Lady Umm Kulthum appeared in front of him. Oh, Imam al-Khumayni, you have mentioned the musibah of my elder sister Zainab al-Kubra, but you did not mention anything about me. How could you forget me and the troubles that I went through? If that was the statement made to Imam al-Khumayni, to remember her, can you imagine that call that is being placed on the shoulders of you and I from today and ongoing? How much we can change history. How much that when you throw one stone into the middle of a pond, that all of those reverberations eventually go out and the ripple effect meets all of the borders of that particular lake. We can make that ripple effect from today. We can change within our communities our understanding of this personality and know her as she deserves to be known. The night of Ashura, there is a narration that says, Sayyidah Zainab sallallahu alayha left her tent. As she walked out of her tent, she heard a conversation, almost like a, a buzzing conversation taking place. She went towards the tent. And she listened in and she heard that this was a tent filled with the companions. None of the family members, just the companions. And she listened in and she heard that Habib ibn Madahir was addressing all of the companions. Oh companions, tomorrow will be the tenth day. Tomorrow will be the day in which you need to go out in front of Aba Abdullah and sacrifice your life. Do not allow any one of you to remain tomorrow. For you will meet with the most beautiful of rewards tomorrow. Sayyidah Zainab al-Kubra wept. She found comfort in the knowledge that those companions were there for her brother. She walked on. And she walked to another tent and again she heard this murmuring, this, this buzz taking place within the tent. And again she listens in and this time she hears, it's the family members discussing amongst themselves. She hears that her brother Abu Fadl Abbas is addressing all of the family members. Qasim, only Muhammad, Akbar. And he says to them, as the general of the army of Hussein, O oh family of Hussein, tomorrow is the tenth day. Know that all of you must go out and fight and not return. Do not allow me to be embarrassed where I see you coming back. You must give your lives in sacrifice for Aba Abdullah tomorrow. Sayyidah Zainab returns back to her tent. And the narrations tell us that Abbas walks out of that tent. And as he heads out of the tent, he walks past another tent. And he hears crying taking place. These tears are coming from none other than Sayyidah Zainab as sughra Um Kurthum. He enters into that tent and he says to her sister, says to his sister, Oh my dear sister, Um Kurthum, why are you crying? She responds back to him and says, Oh my dear brother Abbas, I am embarrassed. I am crying because of the pain which is going through my heart. Oh my dear sister, what pain is going through your heart? 
that tomorrow is the 10th, then every one of the ladies has someone to sacrifice for the master of the martyrs. I do not have a husband here. I do not have any children here. Zainab has owned Muhammad. Layla has Akbar, but who do I have to give towards Hussein tomorrow? I am fearful that on the day of judgment I will present myself in front of my mother Fatima and I will be embarrassed. The most famous of responses comes back. Abu Fadl Abbas says, Oh my dear sister Kulthum, I will become your sacrifice tomorrow on the 10th of Muharram. We say to you, O Lady Um Kulthum, what a wonderful sacrifice you were given. Is there any greater sacrifice than the standard bearer of Hussein on the 10th of Muharram? And on the 11th of Muharram, she became the standard bearer herself. Her and her sister looked after the children. One of the narrations tell us that after the trampling of the body of Hussein, the enemies continued to ride towards the tents. One narration says that Fatima the Sughra, the young daughter of Hussein, leaves the tent. She narrates that I looked out and I saw horsemen coming towards the tent. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether to go towards the horsemen. I didn't know if I should go back into the tents. So I stood there waiting to see what the horsemen would do. The horsemen continued to ride towards me and they did not slow down. I was fearful that they would trample upon my body so I ran away. But this horseman chased me. He began to get a spear and using the backside of the spear he clubbed me towards the floor. Fatima to Sughra says I was knocked unconscious at this point. When I woke up I was resting in the lap of my auntie Um Kurthum I began to cry and said oh, Um Kurthum did you see what has happened to me Oh Kurthum my auntie my hijab has been taken from me please is there any cloth that you can give me to cover my face she responds oh my dear niece Sughra I cannot give you any cloth because even your auntie's cloth has been taken from her and then we see that we should start this story, we should start this movement tonight with remembering what Umm Kurthum sallallahu must have heard in Jannatul Baqir. Hussein leaves the house of the tyrant governor of Walid and of Marwan. They have demanded the allegiance upon him and he has left and he has gone towards the grave of his mother Fatima and towards the grave of his grandfather Rasulullah. He climbs towards this grave and one of the great Farsi poets describes this and says that he climbed upon the grave of his mother Fatima and was reciting an elegy and saying, Khuda Hafiz Medina, farewell to you Medina for this is the final time that I will see you. And then he goes towards the grave of his grandfather Rasulullah. He begins to weep and he says oh my dear grandfather I am tired of this oppression from the world they have not just done justice towards your grandson Hussein he wept so much that he fell asleep on top of the grave of his grandfather Rasulullah Rasulullah comes to him in the dream and says to him oh my dear grandson Hussein you must awake now for the time has come there is a station in paradise that is waiting for you I am witnessing right now that dogs, wild dogs are tearing at your blessed body, that you are crying out for a glass of water and they will not give you that glass of water. You are crying out in a pool of blood and they will kill you in that pool of blood. Oh Hussein, there is a station in paradise that is waiting for you, but you cannot achieve that until your head has been severed. ألا لعنة الله وللقوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي من قلبي ينقلبون إلى الله وإن إليه راجعون مات حسين يا حسين